The Book of Recollections, Episode 9, Trial and Error, by Dysylvania. Let there be a story again. I say, and what a story we shall have. Are you ready for this? You're not ready. Don't argue with me. No one is ready for a good story. Not when it hits you where it hurts. Metaphorically speaking, of course. So, ready or not, here it comes. And, oh, first, if you don't know me, if this voice is unfamiliar to you, well, I am your book of recollections. Let's get to it then. Saturnai's sign language was too obscure for most people within the throne room to be understood. This prompted Rem Mortis, who was both the chancellor of the Augury district and a devout priest of the astral, to reveal that, although the first trial was set, understanding the task was part of the challenge. Lucky for our protagonists, Castiel understood Saturnai's unspoken words, which came in the form of a riddle. They spoke of following the flow of death till the end of the world, of passing a meritorious judgment upon only a seed of knowledge. Most importantly, all of this had to be done within the span of a single day. Although the task was made clear, there was no indication whether the trial had already begun or if the challenges had to wait. As everyone within the chamber pondered this question, a man broke the silence by announcing that both the competitors and their retinues were invited into the royal garden for a private celebration. Although a bit tired due to the events that had taken place over the course of the past four days, our protagonists went to the gathering, hoping that they might be able to get some information in regards to the task at hand. There. Most of the group felt like outsiders being judged by the high-ranking people of Greenspring. Kate, for instance, drew the gaze of many such people due to her unrefined manners. So, she decided her time would be better spent finding Evander and asking him for some upgraded equipment. Jan agreed and went with her. Even Evander, who was used to the polite society of the city, couldn't help but yearn for any excuse to leave the gathering, if only for a few moments. Thus, the trio made their way to the nearby barracks where they were given access to some rather beautiful pieces of armor bearing the symbol of Greenspring. But Keith, while snooping, found a secret stash in which there were two daggers with blades seemingly fashioned of red steel. Evander told them that the daggers were made for a devotee of Martis, which made Kaith feel a bit unsure whether she should take them or not. But opportunity outweighed her uncertainty. Back at the party, however, the remaining members of Evander's retinue tried to mingle somewhat. Adam found Grace drinking whilst watching Monkey making a fool of himself and Although young Hebdom tried his best to express his feelings towards the girl, his advances were deemed too cryptic by Grace, who took them as curious gratitudes for her help. As she left in order to get another drink, Adam remembered that he had to retake the exam the next day and began to look for Castiel. He found the man just as he was about to make an exit. Hearing him out, Castiel agreed to help him in exchange for coin and agreed to meet each other the following day. Adam returned to the celebration, while Castiel went outside and stood in front of the statue of Lucius, gazing at the man who gave humans both a home and a means of defending themselves. But the silence was cut short by the appearance of Leo, who wanted to speak with him as well. The discussion, pleasant at first, took a sour turn as politics were introduced. The Chancellor of the Midnight District was chastised by Castiel so ruthlessly that he tried his best not to punch the man. The heated argument turned red hot, but Evander, who was returning from the barracks, intervened. Although the conflict somewhat cooled down, Castiel discussed humanity's past and how they were oppressed, pointing to the vicious cycle which now saw non-humans as rebel and wanted to know not only whether Evander would be able to put aside his half-human lineage, thus ruling with his mind and not his heart, but also what he would do if he was currently king. 
Evander diplomatically answered to each of the aspects and even apologized to Castiel for making him part of his retinue. Of course, if he wanted to leave, Castiel was free to do so. The three made peace as they returned to the garden party. As Kaith and Genevieve hid their anxieties behind the stern wall of mischief, eavesdropping and jokes, Evander found Grace and invited her to the hedge maze in order to talk in private. There, Evander tried to understand who and what the girl was, but she only retreated more within herself. She tried to convince the half-elf that she was nothing, an orphan, a pawn in whatever game the astrals were playing, which caused Evander to retaliate in a gentle manner, trying to make her realize that she was more than that. Emotions ran high and conscious movement gave way to reflex and the girl kissed Evander. Only a few feet away, three young princes appeared, but they were unable to see Grace and Evander. The heat of the moment caused the half-elven prince to pay no mind to what the children talked about, except for the small one discussing a witch living in the green forest who offered anyone able to guard her ranch for a year one of her three-hearted horses. Also, it seemed that in her domain, one year would pass in but a single day. As the three returned to the party, Evander asked Grace if they wouldn't be able to linger there for a few more minutes. But the girl understood the hurdles their relationship might face and she cut his advances short. As people began to leave the party, Evander and Grace called for their friends and decided that the following night they would meet at the Cock Gourmand and discuss their plans. Jan was the happiest because, for the first time, she would be able to showcase her cooking skills on more than just breakfast. With everyone retiring for the night, Castiel made sure to collect all leftover food before making his way to the orphanage donating half of it to the future of Greenspring. As Martis's day gave way to Mercury's, that morning found Adam entering Castiel's shop. The shop owner was staring at Timmy while calculating how long it would take for them to go bankrupt if the kid would look over the shop whilst he was busy with the trials. The somewhat reticent demeanor of the man was brought even lower by Adam not being able to pay for his lesson. Still, Due to the reputation of his family, Castiel accepted the offer of a later payment, but this time with a daily interest added to it. Below the shop, Castiel gave Adam a spell which would aid him in the upcoming exam. The man made sure Adam understood how it worked and gave him enough time to practice. Luckily for young Hebdom, Castiel's creation proved the perfect test subjects. Before leaving for his exam, Adam was given a large insect that would vanish only after passing the test. With Castiel's aid, our young protagonist passed the exam. But it wasn't magna cum laude, I might add. Keith, however, found herself visited by Mercury in the early hours of the morning. As one might suspect, the conversation wasn't without its awkward moments especially seeing how the Astral's betrayal beneath the Cronus Sanctum cut the deepest. Before leaving, Mercury told Keith that every Astral would want the Half-Elf to join them, which, in turn, made her question her importance and, moreover, the reason why these beings offered her so much attention. Before heading downstairs, Keith directed her two ravens to search for Yarek, and come back if and when they find him. The kitchen at the Cock Gourmand, however, turned into a veritable battlefield where Genevieve took her job extremely seriously. Her mind was filled with only one thought. The feast that would be served that night was going to be the best ever for everyone. The menu was as lavish, if not more so, than any royalty would ever see in their lifetime. Although Leo was there to help, the sudden footsteps of Keith and Adam caused the Danfia to lock her friend in the cupboard so as to not let anyone know that she allowed anyone else to aid her in her preparations. From inside, 
He discerned that the two would spend most of the day together, going out shopping and meeting Adam's mother before attending their meeting. It seemed that Mercury's presence prompted Kate to find out if she was able to do magic herself and what better way to test this notion than to let Adam aid her. The two arrived at Hebdom's mansion. Kate, sporting a beautiful dress and her presence seemed to throw Adam's mother into an ecstatic mood as she believed the two were a couple. Adam told his mother that the two would go to his room to study and that he needed some extra money, to which she offered him 250 solis golden coins and even left the house for a couple of hours. The time spent together made Keith realize that, in order to learn to conjure spells, she had to spend a lot of time reading, which didn't really sit too well with her. Still, although she could feel the boredom setting in, she was determined to further her knowledge. Back at the Cock Gourmand, Leo lent a helping hand in the kitchen and had a heartfelt conversation with Jen, which made them realize that they were not so different after all. One common point was their desire to want to make their fathers proud. Leo disclosed that after her disappearance, he never stopped searching for her and that he offered to help her family before they left for Nocturna Obscura. Jen opened up to her friend regarding the self-loathing she felt due to her father's illness, telling the Chancellor that although they left on rather disheartening terms, she might not be able to tell him how she felt. This moment of pain caused Adanthia to ask why Leo chose to put an end to his life. Caught off guard and knowing that there would be no reason to hide the truth, he alluded to a mixture of stress, loss of one's purpose and heartache coupled with his best friend's disappearance. The day eventually turned into night and the group met at the Coq Gourmand. Grace was the first one to arrive and the events of last night seemed to have kicked her already introverted nature into overdrive as she refused to take off her hood. Evander was the last to arrive and, borrowing a page from his friends, refused, in a quirky way, to explain why he was so late. At the table, the conversations touched upon multiple subjects, from Adam paying just half of the amount owed to Castiel to what both him and Keith were up to and, above all else, why there was so much food. This triggered Jan who was asked to prepare a feast for the group and, after spending the entire day cooking, they had the guile to complain. But what really boiled her blood was Castiel who not only seemed unimpressed with the food, but also, through magical means, purified his plate. After spirits cooled down, the conversation took a turn toward the challenge issued by Saturni. Certain aspects seemed obvious. One of these was the need to follow the Sabbath River. On the other hand, the allocated time frame was way too short. Evander told them what the three princes spoke about the other day, about the witch and her ranch. Unfortunately, he didn't catch the final part. Grace jumped in and added that if one were to fail to guard the ranch, their heads would be lobbed off by the witch. Adam suggested that not all of them had to be present for this part of the trial and that maybe some people could stay behind and try to disturb the competition. Both him and Keith decided to stay back. Before retiring for the night, Keith offered to hand them the map she and Yarek had stolen from the beast folk. After explaining how it worked, Castiel seemed to be the only one able to see its contents which showed the location of the witch's hut. The early hours of the following morning saw the group meeting downstairs in the Coq Gourmand and, as they left, Keith took a final look at her friends. She couldn't help but think that this might very well be the last time she saw some, or all of them, alive. While making their way to the hut, Castiel was intercepted by a dehydrated mosquito who turned out to be a talking one. In exchange for some nourishment, 
It offered a helping hand if and when it was needed. Obliging the creature, he let a few drops of blood into one of his vials, satiating the thirst of the insect. The discussion the group had before their arrival saw Castiel showing a lot of interest in Genevieve, mostly regarding her feeding habits and, with every word spoken by the Danfia, the man took more and more notes. The old woman's hut was a shabby building whose grim appearance was made even grimmer by the placement of pikes, opulently displaying the heads of those who have failed in protecting the horses. But one pike stood empty, slowly moving in the breeze. Every movement caused an unnatural sound, something like an inhuman grunt. And then the pike spoke. This was the recap for episode 9 of Vim, as told by the Book of Recollections. I was Paul Karm, your Vim recap narrator. If you'd like to join us as Vim, the Tale of Immortality premieres, tune in on Sunday at 5 pm UTC on youtube.com slash addicesylvania. New recaps drop every Friday evening. And remember, every subscribe keeps the magic alive. Thanks for sticking with us. Good day, good night, and don't let the vampires bite.